apologies for that. But um, while people, uh, attendees are, are joining, um, I think we'll just uh, just go to some of the housekeeping rules. Um, obviously, by default, uh, your mics are, are muted. Um, but during the course of the presentations by the speakers, if you have um, any questions, uh, ideally put them in the Q and A uh, window. Um, so some of the questions will be answered um, uh, answered while the presentations are going on, or those that aren't answered will be addressed during the uh, question and answer sessions. Um, again, if you do have any questions and you, you wish to speak, you can use the raise hand icon to indicate that you want to speak. But uh, I think the idea will be that we'll allow all the presentations to take place first, and then actually interactive uh, question and answer sessions will take place during the panel the panel session. We're kind of conscious that uh, the presentations are going to be only for 20 minutes. So we want to really allow our presenters the time to go through their presentations and then any proper Q&A questions will take place at the, after everybody has presented. Um, the other thing, um, we'd like to know who you all are. So it would be nice if uh, you can actually introduce yourselves in the, in the chat window, just so that we know exactly who you are. Um, I think what I will do as people are still joining is um, maybe go ahead and uh, give a recap of what happened yesterday. Um, it was a very good, um, it was a very good session. Um, I'll just share my screen and just try to do a recap. There were very many highlights. So I do apologize if I've missed some of the pertinent points that may have been raised yesterday. Um, Right, so um, I'll just try to do a recap of what of all of the speakers um, kind of uh, spoke about. Dr. Anna Persich from UNESCO, um, she spoke first, and like with everybody, you know, it was actually nice to hear that you know uh, COVID nineteen was also a kind of trigger and a reminder of the importance of um, science, technology, and in innovation, and timely and free access to scientific information. And um, she told us that um, an international policy framework on open science was in development, and that the draft recommendation uh, on open science was going to be sent to the UNESCO governing Congress in November. Um, she touched on many areas um, around um, open science, and um, she talked about the areas where areas of action where governments and open science actors can can work together. And she talked about the uh, use of open science to develop shared values and principles. So the, the idea is rather than research and research being competitive, you know, research should be collaborative, um, inclusive, and basically she just touched on the areas uh, that many of us are already familiar with in terms of openness and uh, really uh, minimizing proprietary activity when it comes to, to, to research. So the whole ethos and culture of um, how we conduct research, research based on open science needs to needs to change, um, and so she really spoke to 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 that. And these are some of the key recommendations that they're going to be put into Congress. She also said that even though there'll be a global kind of uh, document that informs open science and open research practice, she acknowledged that. Um, every region or every country should also be able to context contextualize um, 
their recommendations to best fit uh, the situations that we have within our own local regions. Um, then um, Suleiman Bashir, who was the, he represented Professor Galadanchi. He was from Bayero University, Kanu. He basically talked about the, the you know, uh, imperative of open science in the higher education in Nigeria. Of course, he highlighted that there's not enough research going on in higher education. Um, number of reasons for that, infrastructural challenges, um, lack of funding, and then also the kind of proprietary nature in which some research is done and the, the cost of publishing and uh, peer reviews, all of those things were detrimental to the growth of research in, in the global south. And so he acknowledged that you know, open research would be particularly beneficial to developing countries as it lowers the barriers um, of res uh, the barriers for research outputs. Um, of course, he touched on the fact that the TED fund interventions for research grants had helped immensely within the tertiary sector in Nigeria. And in going forward, he did say that uh, there needed to be a formulation of a strong policy for open research in Nigeria and also the availability of robust infrastructure. And uh, he said there was a need to create open platforms to make publishing and sharing of journals or conferences easily available. So, um, and then he also called on TED Fund and others to ensure that there was um, international collaborations to ensure that the dependency on maybe TED Fund for funding was extended beyond them. And TED Fund should look for ways of ensuring they can collaborate with other international funders. Um, then um, Omar Oaya from Wakren uh, gave his presentation. He first of all, touched on some of the uh, activities that Wakren are engaged in um, for the region in the context of the Africa Connect 3 projects. Um, but most of his presentation was really focused on the work he, he does within LibSense. So he uh, talked about some of the LibSense goals to support cultural change in how we, we deal with uh, research practice, providing technical support and building capacity, particularly in our librarians and researchers and uh, particularly talked about um, researchers who are in postgraduates or postdoctorates building capacity in their open research practice. Uh, so he, he, he sort of touched on, touched on that and how uh, training that cadre of researchers would help to um, develop uh, open science communities within our institutions. And of course, he also talked about some of the value-added services that LibSense is providing. And uh, he basically, uh, basically said LibSense is really there to help apply open science in a national or local context. I think he, he then went on to talk about some of the power, uh, pillars on which LibSense strategy is based, you know, policy capacity building and infrastructure. And the overall strategy of LibSense is to build communities of practice and strengthen national services. Uh, he also expressed uh, LibSense's uh, the support that LibSense could bring to an open science action plan that could be part of the much touted NRDF bill that's going to be presented to uh, the National Assembly. Then we had. Uh, Dr. Popola from TED Fund, uh, he, he spoke a lot. He gave us a lot of uh, details about the various funding models that are available for researchers from, from TED Fund. Uh, then he went on to describe uh, the work that the uh, Research Development Steering Committee and the National Research and Development Foundation are engaged in. And he talked about all the thematic areas that um, these um, 
these organizations are dealing with. Then he talked with some in some detail about the um, NRDF bill that needs to be presented to the National Assembly. So they want basically the Senate to pass that bill to establish the NRDF. Um, but he actually acknowledged that in light of this symposium and some of the issues that were being brought up, uh, he, he felt that to even strengthen that uh, bill proposal, some kind of documentation about open science implementation for the country should be included as part of uh, the bill that we're presenting to the Senate. Um, um, and I went on to talk about uh, EcoConnect and our evolution in open science and certainly how we became more aware of open science and our engagement with open science. I talked about our involvement with LibSense and how that increased our awareness and so we were pushing advocacy and closer engagement with the research and education community and uh, that engagement and the open science, open access paradigms have influenced how we've been developing uh, infrastructure and services. And uh, that's kind of culminated in uh, our community open science cloud platform, which is now available. And this is my much, uh, this slide has probably been sent around the world a number of times, but that's basically some of the core services that um, Echo Connect is uh, currently offering from uh, uh, Open Science Community Cloud. Then um, I think obviously the star of uh, day one was obviously uh, Professor Bogoro, uh, who was with us, you know, the Executive Secretary from TED Fund. And of course, uh, he spoke about so many things. So I'm not even sure if I've done justice to capturing everything he, he said. Um, obviously, he, he, he's, he's advocating for the kind of research that will basically address societal problems in Nigeria. Um, he also spoke about the increase in the annual funding for research has been increased from 7.5 billion to 8.5 billion currently, and he's trying to push that next, next year's budget goes up to 10, 10 billion. He mentioned that there are some special mega research grants for selected institutions of between 250 and 300 million. Um, we didn't really have time to take him up on that selection process, but uh, he did mention that. And then he also talked to uh, talked a little bit about the bill for the establishment of the National Research Development Foundation that's going to be presented to the National Assembly. Um, so I think we were able to sort of take him up on uh, uh, how we needed to move forward with all the different stakeholders in, in open science and uh, what we needed to do to work to, uh, together um, and I think he expressed his commitment to, to work with all the stakeholders very clearly. And uh, what he requested as a first step in whatever the action steps are, is that uh, whatever our deliberations are, he wants a report on his desk from this symposium, you know, as soon as possible uh, to start the basis of further engagements with, um, with TED Fund. Um, and I think that was really um, a, just a brief recap of um, what had happened yesterday, but it was a very vibrant, a very vibrant conversation. And I think it was quite informative and uh, impactful for everyone. So um, I think without uh, Wasting too much time, I would like to introduce uh, our moderator for, for today. And uh, that is in the person of Professor Yusuf Saidu. Professor Yusuf Saidu is a professor of biochemistry with the Osmanu Danfodio University, Sokoto. He was one time head of department um, and acting dean postgraduate school of the university. Professor Saidu was the Director of Research, Innovation and Development 
and is currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation Development of the University. He was a Commonwealth Visiting Scholar at the Strathclyde Innovation in Drug Research. That's the Strathclyde Institute for Pharmacy and Biomedical Science Sciences, University of Strathclyde. He is a member of TED Fund Standing Committee on Research and Development. And Professor Yusuf is also a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and a member of the Education Committee of the International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. He is the Editor-in-Chief of the Nigerian Journal of Basic and Applied Sciences. So, uh, Professor Yusuf, um, thank you for joining us, and I'll hand over the reins uh, of this symposium to you. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to moderate today's uh, occasion, and uh, I want to welcome everybody on board. And without waste of time, I will just go ahead to, intro, uh, to introduce the first speaker of the day, who is uh, Professor Halu Junaidu of the Ahmed Bello University. He's going to be talking to us today on open science, um, open science at institutional level, challenges and prospects. Professor Halu Junaidu Balarebe is a professor of computer science at Ahmed Bello University Zaria. He receives his uh, training at Ahmed Bello University, Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London and St. Andrews University, Scotland. He has been an academic in the university system in the UK, Asia, Middle East and Africa since 1990. He attracted many funded research projects, published widely, trained and mentored researchers and industry players in various areas in computing. He is a member of local and international professional organizations. Professor Junaidu won national, national, local, and students honors and award over the years. Professor Junaidu held a number of administrative positions and currently doubles as director Ia Abubakar Institute of ICT and Dean Faculty of Physical Sciences. He's going to be talking to us, just like I have said today, on open science at institutional level, challenges and prospects. Without waste of time, I wish to invite Professor Sahalu to make his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Yusuf, the moderator, and thank you very much, uh, organizers and participants. It's a pleasure for me to be with you and to speak uh, briefly for 20 minutes on this uh, topic. And this is my roadmap, uh, open science and open science principles and pillars. Uh, I think from the discussion yesterday, uh, Dr. Anna has talked about uh, open science the definition, the values, and the action areas. So I think I will skip uh, those parts on my slide. I will concentrate uh, a bit more on the requirements for open science. Before we practice open science, there are certain requirements that have to be met. And I will briefly mention that open science is being increasingly accepted and adopted across the world. And I will focus a bit more on uh, Nigerian higher educational institutions, side by side the requirements. Do we meet the requirements? And what are our prospects for you know, uh, mainstreaming our universities into the open science uh, practice? So this is what I said, Dr. Anna has mentioned what open science is, why it is, what are the values for open science? and uh, what are the including an important uh, value that uh, is being celebrated for open science is that of you know addressing the problem of reproducibility and this is uh, you know mentioned by a fact that 60% uh, of articles in the 
famous nature is said to be not, uh, cannot be reproduced because of lack of data. So open science, you know, when it provides uh, data, it will make, uh, it will lead to, you know, a lot of uh, derivable uh, benefits, one of which is uh, uh, reproducibility. And Dr. Ann also talked about uh, the principles and the action areas, the seven action areas, which uh, Owen has also uh, highlighted. And according to UNESCO, there are a number of uh, elements that constitute uh, open science. One of the most uh, widely uh, you know, adopted is uh, open access to uh, thesis, scientific uh, publications, you know, as I will mention, um, you know, across the, the world, while other, you know, elements are being increasingly uh, adopted. Now, open science also has what uh, some, what the literature elsewhere calls, uh, you know, pillars. Now, these pillars, uh, the first one is open access. And the goal of open access is, of course, uh, said to be 100% uh, uh, free and open access to scientific information and data. And not only is open access uh, cherished, but that the data to be open and software should be fair. They should be findable, they should be accessible, Inter but, uh, treated, uh, you know, sharing a use of, uh, uh, you know, uh, principles and uh, so. And uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, values when, uh, like the possibility that I mentioned, data is uh, fair that afford researchers to able to uh, improve existing needs. And uh, of course, uh, one of us is a recognition of how much it can be to, uh, you know, promote uh, open science practice. Uh, another pillar is said to be in which some people refer to as uh, citizen science. So open science call for researchers to engage with uh, people whose lives may be directly impacted by the findings, uh, so that in this way, those public can find science more relevant and thereby, you know, putting them more uh, poised to invest in, uh, in science to the benefit of all and sundry. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the other, a recognition of recognition reward. Uh, reward and recognition systems are transformed so that uh, so that uh, measures for ways of measuring quality or an impact of research should should should, should transcend the traditional uh, ones where you know you, you base your publications on reputation of so on. And this new paradigm um, assessment uh, should be based on recognition of that focus on real use, real impact to, 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 to the society. And this is gaining traction, uh, particularly in Europe, where funders are changing their you know, funding uh, criteria to include these alternative uh, metrics of reward to researchers. Now, according to a recent uh, publication by LibSense, open science has three critical requirements. Uh, policies, uh, infrastructure, and uh, capacity for the operators and for the users of you know, open uh, scientific resources. So in the next few slides, I will just be showing uh, you know, uh, through the world or in Nigeria or in particular in my university, how some of these things, how we fare against some of these things so that uh, 
we see what challenges there are and how they could be addressed for uh, a smooth and wider adoption uh, and entrenchment of uh, uh, open science. As I said in the opening, um, open science is being increasingly practiced across the world, particularly Europe, they are among the early leaders, and perhaps they still are, and USA, Asia, and Africa. So it's, 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 it's a wind that uh, is increasingly blowing and blowing uh, you know, more uh, noticeably across the world. Uh, briefly, so with respect to those, uh, you know, three elements regarding policy, uh, there is a um, uh, bound uh, policy. So they have a, a policy and they develop this policy through uh also stakeholder engagement and infrastructure european open science uh, cloud which is uh, a federation that uh, you know that links uh, infrastructures and uh, uh and resources across uh, member states uh, in europe actually the 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 key to open science where infrastructure are localized and then are linked at uh, you know uh, institutional uh, national regional and, and and to the world level so there is a lot of uh, you know this uh, in europe capacity there are provisions for what they call education and skills and there are policies for entrenching those awards and rewards there are Committees that have developed alternative measures for rewarding researchers and uh, funding is undertaken to, to ensure that uh, open science entrenches itself in the European community. Uh, over Africa, uh, the entrenchment is not as pronounced as in Europe and elsewhere. But, uh, of course, uh, the interest is growing. With respect to policy, based on a recent uh, presentation by Lens, uh, uh policies on open access is not as widespread as some infrastructural provision uh, across uh, african uh, countries uh, national uh, open access policy is said to be available based on that leap sense uh, survey in these countries and uh, repositories uh, national open access repositories exist and also there are institutional policies and repositories at uh, several levels. But of course, this uh, policy should be available at uh, different levels for, uh, for better and best deployment of open science. Now, coming back to Nigeria, uh, the question is whether there is, uh, in that research, uh, of course, uh, I miss a uh, categorical statement regarding uh, Nigeria, so that's why it does not feature at least in the first two. Uh, uh, and the set of policy is at national uh, funding organizations and at higher educational institutions and research organization level. So that, uh, uh, but I know at uh, Ahmad Bello University, uh, we have gone through a lot of uh, debates as a result of deployment of uh, you know open access repository and that actually that debate led to uh, the development of uh, an institutional policy on op uh, on open uh, access at the institutional level we have uh, one now what about infrastructure uh, of course, we have seen what Europe provides. Uh, in Africa, we have much more, many more challenges. And uh, it's important to understand that uh, open science requires providing reliable internet connectivity uh, and bandwidth for both the scientists as well as the users, the community of uh, scientific results. You know, and it also depends on a global network of uh, data repository. And LibSense, uh, you know, promotes the availability of localized uh, 
you know, infrastructure that can be uh, linked instead of uh, uh, relying on uh, outsourced uh, infrastructure. And of course, uh, coming down to Nigeria, is infrastructural needs, uh, you know, uh, can be at different levels, which uh, is often not available in a number of uh, situations. So I detail this so that, uh, you know, fellow Nigerian higher educational institutions will know the requirements. We need uh, uh, network infrastructure. We need uh, computing infrastructure. We, we need the computers and the servers. In addition to the, uh, the, to the switches, we need data centers. We need, uh, you know, this, this will now be the foundation for on which these repositories, uh, you know, will now will now lie either nationally or institutionally. And of course, as we said, technologies are, are required, and in our case, also uh, power backup that may be silent in other uh, places has to be explicit in in, in our context. To, with respect to infrastructure, again, uh, according to uh, a bit old paper by Samuel in 2016, he has listed uh, availability of uh, institutional repositories. Uh, I, I, based on the inquiries that I made online, as well as through experienced librarians, they are unaware of uh, a national uh, repository uh, in, in Nigeria. But these uh, universities were cited to have uh, institutional uh, repositories. Uh, and of course, I'm sure, considering the age of this uh, paper, there would have been other universities that have not been captured in that uh, 2016 paper. In ABU in particular, apart from uh, featuring in that paper, as is obvious, we also have uh, modest uh, infrastructure with about uh, 70 kilometers of uh, fiber network uh, deployed across our campuses and uh, within the campus put together the 70 kilometers. And we also have uh, a data center that is being managed by uh, qualified uh, uh, you know, personnel. Now with respect to capacity, open science uh, also uh, requires significant investment in capacity building, uh, education and training. And of course, uh, the training is required you know, for various categories of players, the researchers, the research users, the technical developers and managers, the librarians, and the users uh, in general. So there has to be a comprehensive training system, uh, you know, that, that caters for the different roles of the, uh, of the, of the players. Now, advocacy um, is also, um, Perhaps it can be considered as part of the infrastructure, but it's a very important component in the acceptability of, uh, you know, open open science. Because there is people need to know it's a different paradigm, and there is uh, there are values in it. Uh, so, you know, in many uh, cases, people need to be aware, and I'm, you know. Uh, Apart from the efforts of EcoConnect, I am unaware of uh, other initiatives that try to, you know, to do this uh, community engagement in order to break the jinx of what uh, uh, values open science has to has to offer. So, with respect to uh, those requirements of uh, policy infrastructure, we have seen that policy exists uh, as far as the literature shows uh, at institutional uh, level. Now, at uh, looking at the world map, where do we uh, stand with respect to the digital infrastructure? Uh, because one of the challenging thing is uh, certainly we may uh metrics in nigeria is is difficult to get so it's difficult perhaps sometimes to say uh, something is uh, not there if you don't find it 
So nevertheless, without, uh, so we go to some international metrics, international indices to suggest where we stand. And according to the Global Connectivity Index of uh, Huawei, with respect to infrastructure, uh, Nigeria does not seem to stand very tall among uh, the peers. Of course, it is uh, interesting that uh, you know the um, the index according to the index is uh, Nigeria is steadily increasing and it would have increased a bit more by now. And those uh, indices were with respect to you know a number of indicators, including uh, broadband, data center, cloud, big data, all of these, all of which are necessary for you know the practice of open science. And again, another index uh, shows that uh, in terms of uh, use of smartphones, which are some of the means of accessing you know, uh, data, other research data or any data that is available, again, we need to improve. Uh, broadband penetration uh, as at, uh, was 43% at a few months ago, again, with respect to human capital, the, 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 the competence that we are saying. Again, the, the easiest thing we can fall back on is some of these international indices that shows again here, uh, it's a bit of a challenge, again, with respect to Nigeria regarding the human capital index. We again need, it's a challenge, we need to do a bit more in order to build the right uh, capacity so that we have the uh, all the uh, basics that we need in order to practice uh, uh, open science uh, better. So these indices are there just to, to try to gauge where Nigeria stands with respect to those, uh, to those requirements. So these indices certainly show that there are gaps. There are a lot of challenges that need to be overcome in order for us to... Yeah, of course, there are a lot of uh, prospects because Nigeria has uh, great potential for open science because of its uh, large uh, population. The, uh, the, the, the population of researchers and researchers that can be leveraged for productivity and uh, visibility. In the presentation that was just highlighted, um, Professor Galadenchi, it, you know, there was not little research, but other literature out there said that there is a lot of research going on in Nigeria, but that research is not visible. And, and I tend to side with the latter argument. I know that people do a lot of research. Uh, the main challenge is that uh, those researches, you know, are not, uh, are not visible. So open science can make that visibility. And another potential is that there are willing funders like uh, TED Fund, uh, as well as also international partnerships are ready to provide policy backing is there. And another assessment of uh, prospect was uh, by industry experts that estimate a cloud computing market potential of 1 billion Naira for Nigeria. So again, uh, whether you have, you localize your infrastructure or you, 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 you host it on uh, cloud, then there are potentials for Nigeria. And once uh, these potentials are overcome, then there are a lot of prospects. We can get the maximum benefit of investment in science. We can also max uh, society engagement. And uh, we also key into frameworks that will be agreed upon through open science, like open data format, so that we can share and consume data from uh, local and international sources uh, and uh, increase funding also. Potential for funding increase, you know, is also, uh, is also, uh, another important uh, benefit. So in, in conclusion, I am saying that briefly on these slides, perhaps I should have been slower. I have not been one of time. Perhaps I should have been slower somewhere. 
So uh, we just mentioned, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, you should start rounding now because your time is actually over. Very much. Uh, I didn't want to wait for the warning, so I was looking at my watch. So I briefly have reviewed in this uh, presentation, open science, it values, principles, and pillars. Of course, I didn't talk about those because uh, they have already been covered, but I left them on the slide for quick reference. I also mentioned that uh, according to the literature, uh, of, you know, policy, infrastructure, and capacity form a, an important necessary condition but obviously not sufficient for the deployment of uh, uh, open science. And that uh, robust and localized interoperable infrastructure is necessary for, uh, as promoted by LibSense, that we should have, you know, localized infrastructure as institutional, uh, national, regional level that are federated for, 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 for the benefit of, uh, our researchers and uh, the society. And collaboration is, is essential. You can see that EcoConnect is doing a lot of uh, advocacy and more for, for, the, um, for the development of uh, open science, uh, especially in advocacy here that we said. So deliberate advocacy within, uh, as I said, it was as a result of the debate of this uh, you know, open educational resources that, that led to actually drafting uh, an open access uh, policy in Ahmadiyya University. And uh, lastly, but perhaps most importantly, mobilizing adequate uh, material, human and financial resources uh, are necessary for the deployment and practice of uh, open science. So Mr. Chairman, this is the brief that uh, I have, and these are some of the references uh, from which uh, these uh, materials were obtained. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Salu, for that brilliant uh, presentation on open science at institutional level in Nigeria, uh, challenges and prospects. Uh, of course, he presented uh, elegantly well and uh, gave the challenges and prospects, especially for Nigeria. Uh, without much ado, I will go straight to the next presenter, who is uh, Dr. Pam Abbott. Uh, he's going to be talking to us today on upskilling and reskilling librarians and researchers for open science. Uh, he's of the Information School, University of Sheffield. Uh, Dr. Pamela Abbott, is a senior lecturer in information system in the information school at the University of Sheffield, UK. Her research is mainly applied and is concerned with the social and organizational impacts of information systems in use. Two main areas of interest are IT enabled distributed collaborative work for digital collaboration and investigating the relationship between ICT and societal change for development outcomes, mainly in global South context. Our most recent funded project investigates higher education information professionals in African higher education institutions and their institutional support for delivering an open science agenda. Previously, she has been a core investigator on two Horizon 2020 EU projects, both undertaken in Africa about African e infrastructure development and advocacy of national research and educational network in Africa. She also has a research interest in critical views on open scholarship in Africa, which has been supported by UK GCRA funding. Today, she is going to be talking to us on upskilling and reskilling librarians and researchers for open science. I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Pam Abbott to make her presentations. Thank you very much for the introduction to my talk. And also thank you to Owen for inviting me to give this small presentation at this symposium. As uh, you have been uh, told, I'm a senior lecturer in the Information School at the University of Sheffield, and my key research area is information systems. 
Today, mostly I'm going to talk about my role in LibSense in helping to promote skills development for higher education librarians uh, in Africa. So my talk will focus on these four areas. First, I'll talk a bit about openness. There's been a lot, of course, within the symposium about this, so I'll only have one small slide on that. Then I'll talk about my role in LibSense in promoting skills development for um, librarians. Then I'll talk about what, um, what we gain from the literature on library and information science about this, about the challenges to librarians and their professions with regard to learning new skills that are motivated by the changes uh, that they'll need to take to, um, to um, support open science in their institutions. And then I'll talk about the work we did in LibSense around skills profiling. So first of all, openness in research, um, as I'm sure you are already aware, there are some terms that are generally used interchangeably to, uh, to speak about what's happening nowadays with respect to the doing of science, what I call the doing of science. So science is, is now becoming more open and more collaborative. And instead of it being the purview or the province of academics and scientists, or people from the global north who have a lot of powerful uh, networks and a lot of connections and a lot of scientific knowledge, instead of it being sort of generally concentrated in certain, within certain peers, certain elite groups, et cetera, science is now becoming more collaborative and uh, more available to, to everyone. And the way it is happening is through these open uh, movements like open science, open scholarship or open research. This idea of uh, openness in science is not, is not new. However, what is making this happen more readily nowadays is the availability of digital technologies and the idea that all our processes and practices are becoming more and more digitized and therefore it is possible um, for the, the realization of open science to happen. For example, ICTs or information and communication technologies, they allow us more transparency especially uh, with respect to information being shared. It allows more reach so that there are more communities that can benefit from the sharing of this information. There's more computational power available, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these affordances allow open science to be realized so that we have things like open data, the sharing of data through open standards and shared platforms or open access, the sharing of published knowledge, and citizen science, allowing citizens to participate openly in the production of science. So LibSense has as its vision, an op uh, open science is an ideal future for research and education in Africa. It is one of the founding tenets of the LibSense initiative. And I have been involved with LibSense in about, since about 2016 in helping to coordinate research activities in projects that are run by this, uh, this movement. In 2018, I led a three region survey uh, in three REN areas. So REN stands for Research and Education Network Organizations, of which there are three regional ones that um, oversee activities in East and Southern Africa and Western Central Africa and Northern Africa. And so together with Bakren, we ran this survey in these uh, three regions, had about 323 respondents, most of them were librarians in management positions, uh, had a response rate of about 23% uh, of those that we surveyed. And from the results of that um, uh, survey, it was clear that there were issues uh, uh, around librarian skills, that the skills uh, of African higher education librarians would need rethinking and reframing for the future and that um, skills profile development was an important aspect for us in LibSense to carry out. So how does one reskill a librarian? Are there three main ways that this could be done? One, of course, is through education. So more different and more updated curricula in the library and information science schools, if that is possible. Through training, uh, continuing professional development and capacity building. And of course, a third way is for some rethinking of the role that the academic library might play in higher education institutions in the sector. And this would, of course, require a strategic rethinking 
of the role of those institutions in the higher education sector. I have some examples here. So if, um, if the higher education institution is going to be mainly a training institution or a research institution or oriented towards development goals like sustainable development goals or towards community engagement or some kind of new type of post-COVID institution or a combination of all of these, all of these uh, types. So depending on what the strategic direction of the institution would be, then the role of the library would be to support that particular vision and therefore the way in which the reskill librarians for that context would become relevant and contingent to that particular context. Literature plays a big role in telling us what um, librarians' future profession might look like. And we have uh, quite a bit of that that we can gather from the literature. So we have got new roles that are related to data, like research data management, data steward, stewardship, data science. We have got new roles that are related to supporting researchers being embedded within research teams. We have got softer skills that are related to things like management, negotiation, communication. Uh, these are um, characteristics, job characteristics that are more associated with executive management. We have got uh, the open platform services specific to openness, specific technical uh, capabilities related to openness. We have got scholarly communications and publishing. So all these areas the literature tells us are key to the, uh, the emerging librarians roles. And just to give you a few examples also from literature, we've got here an example of some two cycles. This is a, a typical research life cycle from the time that the idea behind the research is proposed to the data capture and to the modeling and the production of research articles, education and training around that, policy change, et cetera. Everything sort of goes around and around in a cycle like this. And out here on the orange part are the uh, aspects which are digitized. So when making this uh, research cycle open, we have all these digitized aspects taking place on the outskirts of, of, of the cycle. And here's where our librarians, their new skills are going to be um, uh, changed and where, which they're going to have to support. So we've got, for example, when collecting data, we've got research data management, archiving and publishing taking place and librarians need to support that sort of role. Or we've got the open access here on the site when research articles have been produced. Or over here, we've got another example of a research life cycle, same, same sort of idea, but then we've got more engagement here at the data, uh, data management and data stewardship parts of that research process. And here again, librarians are expected to play a key role in supporting those uh, processes. Another way in which librarians' roles are changing is through the publishing uh, cycle. So traditionally, libraries kind of hold this uh, sort of um, uh, gatekeeper role where um, publishing takes place between the, the writers, the authors, the editors, and et cetera, referees, et cetera. And um, the publishing company would uh, provide services to produce the, those outputs. Um, uh, but now with, um, with digitization of these processes, we have got disintermediation taking place and we have open repositories being able to publish authors outputs without the intervention of publishers. And here's where libraries can play a role in actually providing platforms on which to publish those open um, resources. So they can disintermediate what's happening traditionally with um, um, publishing companies. So libraries are playing different roles now or can play different roles. And th these are the sorts of things that LibSense wants to get involved with. Want to get involved with all these aspects underlying um, open science, the, 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 the new data management protocols and practices, the new publishing protocols and practices, practices and so on. Hybrid roles. So with all of this talk about new roles for librarians, we need to look at what's traditional for librarians and what the new roles might entail. So uh, I just mentioned this role about the, being a gatekeeper. There's also the idea that librarians, um, they uh, support, they're more support you know, sort of existing and supporting roles rather than being innovators of change. 
all of this is, is sort of turning on its head because of digitization that's taking place. So we have got uh, librarians that are at the forefront of new technical changes in there and the activities that they do. And some of these are called hybrid roles. So we see a need, for example, now for more practical technical skills, uh, but we also see a need for that to be balanced out with softer skills and, and uh, 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 authors refer to this as socio-technical competencies that need to be um, learned by, um, by librarians. Uh, and this leads to certain kinds of hybrid roles. Some of them are mentioned here. So we've got the informationist role, for example. Uh, we have got data science competencies that are they're not traditional librarian roles and so on. And uh, it seems that some of these skills overlap into certain areas like open access repositories and research data management. And if you're a librarian in the new uh, scheme of things, you need some competencies in these areas. This is a visual representation of that, where you can see this sort of a, a little schema of um, a typical university environment where you have got all these different actors who are involved in what is science, the production of science and knowledge. You've got your librarians, you've got faculty, both on the teaching and research side. You have got technology professionals who help us support the infrastructure. You've got administrators and managers. And what we're saying is that increasingly at the borders of all these different uh, areas, we have got these roles that are being that are emerging that librarians are more and more taking charge of. So you've got uh, between academic librarians and faculty, you've got research data manager, librarians having to take on those sorts of roles between the um, library and the administration, you've got these kinds of knowledge managers and people having to have different kinds of skill sets to um, understand and to undertake these roles and so on and so forth. So this kind of gives you a nice overview of what might be, why, why these roles are emerging because they're sort of at the borders of traditional, what the tradition, traditional library does and what these uh, new uh, competencies are that are emerging, what they are, uh, have, what they are emerging to be and how librarians need to embrace that. So when we ran our workshops and um, surveys with the LibSense community, we asked them about these things, these issues, about what they felt was the evolving librarian role that they would have to move into in the future as African higher education librarians. And we got some of, these are some of the responses we got. So they, they saw their role being translated into a digital form. So the traditional role being now a digital form of that traditional role. So like if you're traditionally a gatekeeper, you become a digital gatekeeper, that sort of thing. They also saw other roles that are more um, intermediate, intermediating and disintermediating. For example, an intermediary role, a boundary spanner role, a focal point role, a community builder role. They saw leadership and influential roles being uh, emerging for them to take on. So roles more at the top of executive management in the institutions. Technical competence uh, was emerging or having to have multiple roles rather than just one activity or one thing that they are associated with to have multiple or blended roles. Having a strong training and education role, a strong research support role, being knowledgeable of open platforms and services, understanding the higher learning institution context, so get going beyond the library and actually having a broader view of what's happening altogether in the, uh, the, the sector and in the scholarly communications process and being at the forefront of advocacy and promotional, uh, being an advocate and promotional type um, role. Uh, some of the things they saw as being helpful or characteristics they need to develop were these uh, at this side, which are uh, very soft skills. If you look at them, they're quite soft skills. But the usual barriers, they also identified things like the role not being respected, and they associated this with qualifications, having the appropriate qualifications to be respected by academics in their communities, the role not being valued and role not being influential, not high enough up in the ex executive management uh, of their institutions. 
um, and uh, yeah, the need for these continuing, the continuous development of their professional skills, always to be up to date with the latest technologies. We had this feedback from them also into what I call the buckets, the buckets of um, skill sets that they think they will be evolving into. These are all future roles, the, the purples, the blues, the, and so on, we've, we've color coded them. And you can see here in the red ones, these are the ones that are more associated with open science. These are some of the aspects that they saw specifically related to skill sets to support open science. You can see some that are familiar, research data manager, metadata, library, and so on. We also asked them the kind of, if you had certain skill sets that you wanted to develop that are digital, what would they be? And if you had certain skill sets that you wanted to develop that were supportive of open science, what would they be? And we got this sort of difference between the, the major issues they saw with digital skills were around Dr. the physical. Dr. you actually have about five minutes. Well, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so they had these particular mm -hmm. skills around the technical aspects of, of um, the whole, you know, pr producing digital services. Whereas when it came to open skill sets, it was more around knowing how to provide the open services. Our skills development webinars then were developed uh, in response to the survey results and um, the AC Connect, Africa Connects three project objectives. And we had, we did a whole eight week um, timeline with developing this participatory uh, workshop with the librarians. And uh, this was a virtual webinar. So we had librarians from various regions and we had uh, experts, facilitators from different universities across these different regions uh, who were themselves experts, um, librarians in, in these different areas, the, the open science and evolving open science um, skill sets areas. So we developed a workshop with them developed some materials around skills profiles, which I'll give you an example of here. This is called the Metadata Librarian skill set. We look for their knowledge, skills, and other capabilities, and we ask them to evaluate this in the workshop. And this would be an example of the worksheet that was produced from evaluating this in the workshop, where they mentioned uh, things like what were the traditional librarian skills as opposed to the ones that were more technically oriented or blended. So we could get some kind of idea of how they saw their roles evolving. Uh, the main profiles that came out of those workshops were these eight ones that are mentioned here. The most popular ones were around scholarly communications and repository management. We had less interest in research data management, which is quite important, and quite a lot of interest around um, the uh, sort of indigenous knowledge type new librarian function, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge type function. Um, we did also one in the Francophone area and produced some, uh, got representation from quite a few countries in, in the Francophone area. And we have some, got reports from them, which we are going to turn around into new uh, bespoke training for that, for those areas. Um, that's the end of my presentation, a little bit before time, but I just wanted to, also show you the, the um, these are the literatures then that we accessed to help develop those um, profile, those seminars, the, the webinar and the seminar materials. As you can see, there's quite a lot of it. Uh, and I just hope that we can continue this work and continue building on um, finding ways to help librarians to understand their new skills, new skills that they need to develop and putting those capacity development workshops in place. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pam, for that brilliant presentation on reskilling up and upskilling of uh, Liberians and researchers. Uh, we want to thank you most sincerely for that presentation. Uh, we will all notice that we are supposed to have 10 minutes break but uh, because we started behind schedule, uh, I will just proceed to invite the next speaker to make uh, the next presentation. Uh, the next presentation is, is going to be made by Irina Kushma, who is going to be speaking to us on 
open science community and capacity building. Is of open access program. Is the open access program manager, electronic information for libraries. Uh, Irina is the EIFL open access program manager, working in collaboration with libraries and library consort, uh, consortia in more than 50 countries in Africa, Asia, and Europe. She advocates for open access to research results, facilitates the development and implementation of open access policies and infrastructures and provide support and training. Irina also coordinates the open AIRE community of practice for training coordinators and is the chairperson of the open AIRE training and support standing committee. He sits on the board of directors of the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services and the Networked Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations. She serves on the UNESCO Open Science Advisory, uh, Advisory Committee as an international expert. Irina is a member of the coalition Publi.ca uh, International Committee and the DS Space Community Advisory Team. She is an associate editor for the directory Directory of Open Access Journal. In 2013, Irina received the Electronic Publishing Trust for Development Annual Award in Electronic Publishing uh, in recognition of her efforts in the furtherance of open access to scholarly publication in developing and emerging countries. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to invite Irina Kushma to make her presentation. Thank you so much, Prof, and uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you how we can uh, together build uh, efficient uh, open science uh, communities and uh, open science capacities uh, in uh, Nigeria, but also in, uh, in other African countries. And uh, Anna, described uh, yesterday uh, draft UNESCO open science recommendations uh, that include uh, seven areas listed on this slide. And if we think about uh, open science communities and uh, open science capacity building, I bolded some of uh, the actions where community and capacity building plays a role. But uh, actually, all of those areas, uh, even uh, open science infrastructure and services, uh, require skilled people to build those services and infrastructures and also uh, use them and um, practice um, open science. Um, I like uh, this uh, pyramid of culture change uh, that uh, was drafted by uh, Brian Nosek, who is a professor in psychology, and uh, he's also a founder of uh, Center for Open Science and uh, Open Science Framework. And uh, he describes how infrastructures enable open science, if we add open science to each of uh, the layer of this pyramid there. And then uh, if those infrastructures have uh, easy to use uh, interfaces, then uh, more researchers and uh, other actors would use them. And then you really need communities to make use of those infrastructures. And uh, those communities should uh, change the research practices and uh, embed open science, open research practices in um, the way they they operate as communities. Um, so it really requires change in research culture. And then uh, we need incentives, how institutions, uh, funders, governments could reward researchers for practicing open science. And then we need policies that uh, would make it required. And uh, this uh, culture change pyramid was uh, taken by uh, researchers uh, in the Netherlands uh, that uh, wanted to support implementation of the national uh, open science plan. And what they did, they started launching uh, 
institutional universities, uh, open science um, communities. Uh, and uh, I think by now, every university in the Netherlands has this kind of open science communities and they are groups of researchers who practice open science and they also promote and advocate uh, open science uh, to their peers, to other researchers. Uh, and um, this movement also got uh, international traction and uh, there are open science communities in uh, Ireland, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in uh, Serbia. And uh, my colleagues in Serbia had an interesting approach. Uh, they used to have uh, open science champions in universities, uh, selected researchers, groups of researchers that uh, were happy to start practicing open science and also help their colleagues to, to do so. But then uh, champion sounds a bit uh, excluding. It sounds like uh, just selected few. And then they decided, why don't we change the name and why don't we aim for building uh, real communities and making sure that more researchers join the movement uh, and that really worked well. So then they basically renamed uh, open science champions in uh, universities uh, as uh, open science community representatives and um, they're launching their national open science community. And um, there are similar interesting developments in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Owen mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, Women in Ukraine program and uh, ICT training pr programs for girls. And that's how open science communities started uh, in Saudi Arabia when uh, uh, women practicing uh, R and other trainings uh, started uh, getting together and uh, looking how they can. Um, enhance open science developments and they launched their open science community uh, Saudi Arabia. And um, we would like to have a webinar with representatives of these groups in, um, in the Netherlands, in Serbia, in Saudi Arabia in October to share their experiences. But I think that's also something that uh, your universities could already start uh, looking into or maybe uh, uh, it could also be done on the national level. And uh, there is uh, a very good uh, open science community starter kit uh, and I'll share a link um, in the chat when, when I finish uh, talking. Uh, and uh, it basically explains uh, different steps, how we can uh, prepare and launch such a community. For example, in Serbia, like I mentioned, they started with open science champions, or in some cases, they were even open access champions only. And then how you can grow and inspire, force and maintain and uh, dream and scheme. And uh, it's, it's a real community which supports each other. So if, if you're interested, I'm happy to connect you with, with this international community. And uh, I think that's one of the areas that uh, we will be working on uh, in LibSense as well. Uh, back to UNESCO Open Science Recommendations, uh, they have um, had in uh, one of the action areas, which is uh, investing in uh, human resources, training, um, and education. And uh, here, there is uh, a call to institutions and also to countries to make sure that uh, systematic and continuous capacity building on open science concepts and practices um, is provided on the institutional and also on, on the national level. Um, and then uh, there is an agreed framework of um, open science competencies, uh, which uh, works for different disciplines and also for researchers at different career stages, early career researchers or even senior researchers. 
And um, there was a question yesterday about uh, private sector and industry. And of course, those open science competencies should also work for industry and um, also for civil society organizations. Uh, and then there is a call uh, to develop recognized skills and training programs to support the attainment of um, these competencies. Um, in Europe, where I'm based, uh, there is an ambition to develop uh, digital research skills and competencies uh, frameworks uh, for the European Open Science Cloud. And these developments could also be uh, interesting for Africa, but of course, uh, they would need um, adjustments. Um, and uh, I think it's really high time to try to think uh, about this together in uh, in Nigeria and I don't know, maybe uh, create uh, a group of like-minded people who could start working on, uh, on these questions. Um, and uh, I work for IFL, which is uh, a non-governmental organization that works with uh, National um, Library Consortia in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And uh, Nigeria was uh, the very first country which I visited when I started working for IFL, and I really miss ABU and uh, Zaria. And uh, what we did for IFL, uh, in the past and what we identified as one of Eiffel's priorities is that uh, in our strategic plan for the coming three years, we included uh, some actions to support research, teaching and learning. And uh, those actions are on this slide, um, enhance open science and open research skills, support our partner countries uh, launching and implementing open science training programs, uh, and also making sure that uh, uh, institutional and national research incentives and structures support and promote uh, the acquisition of open science and open um, research skills. Um, and to help librarians to be more effective in um, training researchers uh, on open science, open research skills. We developed uh, a resource which is called um, IFL Digital uh, Research Literacy Training Program uh, for librarians. And uh, it has librarians in the title, but these are librarians who are already training researchers or going to train researchers. Uh, and we structured this uh, research along the life cycle uh, that Pam showed, uh, which includes uh, research cycle, which includes uh, discovering, managing research data, publishing, uh, disseminating, and um, increasing visibility and measuring impact. And it covers all, all research elements and all research outputs. And I'll also, when, when I finish speaking, I'll put a link to this resource in, um, in a chat. Uh, so you're welcome to use it. And if you have some suggestions what should be added, we, we're happy to expand this resource. And we're also happy to, to work with librarians to organize specific webinars or other support actions uh, on that. Um, uh, our colleagues in Uganda and uh, David Bukenia is uh, attending this webinar today, uh, hosted uh, their National Open Science Symposium uh, in uh, July, uh, consortium of Uganda University libraries organize it. Uh, and uh, they uh, issued uh, key recommendations for practical implementation of uh, open science. And some of those recommendations focus on training. And uh, they uh, recommend uh, universities develop skills development programs and look at uh, hybrid roles of data related and research rela related librarians roles, like Pam mentioned, and de design training programs for researchers uh, and uh, include those programs in uh, curriculum and also train researchers on uh, open sciences. Uh, default practice uh, for research. Um, 
And another interesting idea that David and his colleagues uh, in U Uganda have, they, uh, they are discussing this competence center approach. And that's also something that works uh, quite well uh, for European universities where either libraries or CT units or postgraduate units or a number of units in universities set up uh, a center that is tasked with uh, building uh, digital research uh, skills uh, of either early career researchers or all researchers. Uh, and uh, that's a vision that David and his colleagues have um, in Uganda, a center most likely in Ugandan context based in uh, libraries, uh, of course, in collaboration with learning units, uh, which will help uh, apply open science practices uh, and train uh, early career researchers. Uh, Another activity that well, we did in uh, June, July was with our partners um, in Ethiopia, a consortium of Ethiopian uh, academic and research libraries. Um, they felt that uh, there is a huge need to train researchers, especially early career researchers on uh, open access publishing and research data management. Um, and uh, they uh, developed uh, an e-learning course, which is available uh, in Moodle uh, of uh, Addis Ababa University. And uh, it's been finalized and uh, we'll be happy to share content of that course with everyone because it was meant to be a reusable course. Um, and uh, they also managed to train uh, almost 600 uh, researchers and uh, over 100 librarians in um, just uh, two months. Uh, and it was a small group of uh, people from uh, Addis Ababa University and um, consortium. Uh, so again, if uh, some of you are interested in uh, starting training researchers in, uh, in your institutions on uh, open access publishing, uh, research data management, uh, we'll be happy to collaborate with you. And I'm sure you're already doing uh, at least open access training. So maybe we can share experiences and learn from each other. And uh, Omo showed uh, the slides yesterday that uh, capacity building is an integral part of uh, Lipson's community. And uh, that's what we want to strengthen uh, open science communities of practice uh, in Africa and uh, in Nigeria and also in, in, in other African countries. Uh, and uh, capacity building is part of uh, national Lipson's work. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to brainstorm together how we can uh, develop uh, training and skills program uh, um, on the national level uh, and uh, of course also on, on the institutional level because I think that's where things should should really start. And um, we, we, we yeah, hope, yeah, probably, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's that's really my last slide there. And um, we, we hope to launch uh, an early career open science uh, training program uh, in Lipsens and uh, Nigeria will be a part of it. Sir. So I'd like to end up with, with a question to everyone. Uh, what do you think you could do on your institutional level to start building open science skills? And uh, what can we do together in Nigeria or um, in Lipsens in Africa? And uh, please add your suggestions in the chat and uh, we'll be happy to keep talking uh, about that and uh, make sure that uh, researchers in Nigeria and other African countries are, are confident practicing open science. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Erina, for that brilliant presentation on uh, open access community and capacity building uh we will just move to the next presenter uh nabil kisibi uh he's going to be talking to us on persistent identifiers for connecting research output researchers and research funding uh 
she is uh, the engagement lead on ORCID. Um, Nabil is responsible for fostering ORCID community adoption in the Middle East and Africa. As part of his responsibilities, Nabil supports ORCID members as they develop new and existing integration and workflows. Previously, he worked at uh, Hewlett Parker Enterprise and covering the Middle East, Mediterranean, and African region. Nabil believes in the ORCID mission and seeks to build collaboration across the region. From Tunis and now based in Johannesburg, Nabil is passionate about engineering, arts, humanitarian work. In addition to English, he is fluent in Arabic and French. We want to welcome Nabil to today's presentation and we'll be happy to have his presentation. You're welcome, Nabil. Um, the, the presentation will be in English. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf. And yeah, special thanks to um, EcoConnect, to Owen uh, for organizing this and uh, really to Akron uh, and to Omo for uh, coordinating as well. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be uh, in this panel um, today and um, with, with yesterday's um, speakers. Uh, well, to be very brief, I'll be uh, presenting or sharing uh, some of my vision uh, regarding PIDs and some of the uh, like the global standards um, uh, definitions around PIDs. Uh, so, without further saying, uh, I'm gonna share, share the basic definition of PIDs, which is uh, inspired from Wikipedia and which is saying that persistent identifier is a um, long lasting reference to a document file, web page or other object. And as you can see here in the screen, there's many logos, all those are PIDs and we'll try to classify them and discover um, what they do basically. So uh, this is my, uh, yeah, how, how I did imagine basically uh, PIDs and sorry, I'm gonna, uh, close the um, video just to share more bandwidth. Uh, this is like what, what I imagined basically um, when, when thinking of the uh, open science infrastructure and uh, its relation to, or its relationship with, with bits. Uh, so this is my, um, let's say, my, my home in, in Tunisia, and this is my, uh, let's say, neighborhood. I really uh, imagine this analogy between um, this um, neighbor's kid that is uh, requesting to have the teapot, basically, from, uh, from the kitchen, which I imagine that is the repository of, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, let's say, this, uh, this initiative or this project. And then um, I really tagged uh, everything in this transaction, like the teapot. Uh, I really need. I I know that it's teapot, so I uh, this is like uh, this is its object identifier. Uh, the uh, person is uh, really known because I know him and I know the the, the neighbors. Let's say, uh, and um, the home identification because I know the uh, the neighbor's home and it's I can even see it. And also I know the connectivity uh, identification because this is the son of, um, let's say our neighbor. And I know that, I know yeah, his mother, his father, and I know all of it about this. And the same situation for a uh, organization or an institution, we should have quite similar analogy, let's say, when a um, publication or work should be uh, identified as an object in order to do basically this uh, open sharing transaction or um, open uh, science movement between this institution and this individual. That can be a researcher, can be an innovator, or uh, can be just a reader. So uh, this, um, this researcher or this author uh, should be also identified as a person and uh, also the organization that is uh, 
uh, let's say affiliated with this researcher or uh, with whom he's, um, he's he's affiliated like um, with a uh, organizational identifier so this is basically this uh, this analogy and you can also um, i mean yeah provide any critics or uh, any feedback around this and then uh, why uh, why pits are here basically uh, because unesco uh, said that in their recommendations so you can check the uh, article 9 if the of the unesco recommendations regarding um, open science and you can see that uh, the persistent unique identifiers are um, they're mentioned a couple of times, like in here in uh, um, in open uh, research environment, in digital uh, uh, research services, and uh, everywhere in the basically open science infrastructure. Then uh, I wanted also to share the citation. This is uh, a quite uh, interesting citation for me. It says the issue of citation citation standards became. Um, important in the online world as well. Studies have shown that within a few years of being cited, a significant percentage of web addresses go dead. And I say um, web addresses means uh, links to works or publications or um, thesis or any kind of research contribution. And this is inspired from this work and you can uh, consult uh, this publication by, by yourself. Uh, then um, this uh, this is like basically the pits for organizations. Uh, uh, these are the most known in let's say in the uh, research community. We have uh, the ROR, which is the uh, Research Organization Registry, uh, which is now um, basically replacing GRID. We have the Ring Gold, and we will see an example from. Uh, this database in the couple of in the next couple of slides, and we have the LEI, which is Legal Identity Identifier, uh, which is mainly for um, legal entities participating in financial uh, tran transactions. Uh, so now uh, Ring Gold in action. Uh, if I want, so yeah, yesterday, <laughs> and sorry for this, Omo. I discovered that uh, University of Benin is actually in Nigeria. So I'm I'm from Africa. I'm from Tunisia. Uh, I went to Nigeria, but I didn't know um, until yesterday. I didn't know that uh, University of Benin is in Benin City in in Nigeria. I thought that uh, yeah, it's it's in Benin, like uh, like uh, like country, like separate to um, yeah, <laughs> like in a very different country. Uh, so really check this, I went to Ring Gold and I found out this unique identifier for uh, University of Benin, uh, which is this one, uh, which is the Ring Gold ID, and which is corresponding to an ISNI ID, if you can see here. And in this database, I really found everything, the region, the country, uh, the admin level, um, the city, the type, everything that I needed. So I can like build a system and use a unique identifier for University of Benin, uh, which is interoperable and which can be uh, retrieved from the registry of Ring Gold as uh, an open um, registry and uh, yeah, with, with a, let's say uh, a global um, uh, spread. Uh, this is an example from University of Australia. Uh, they created LibGuide basically to share uh, the um, uh, bids for uh, contributors uh, and um, define them in a way. So basically we have uh, three of them, the uh, ORCID ID, the Scopus ID, and the Researcher ID. Uh, for the Researcher ID, it's now part of Web of Science, uh, so it's part of Clarivate Analytics. Uh, the one that is a non-profit and free and yeah, gaining more popularity, let's say, is the ORCID ID with now more than uh, uh, 12 million ORCID ID in, in the registry. And why uh, bids for contributors? So this, this article is showing that uh, we have a lot of others called Twang and this is this triggered a uh, tweet when a researcher shared with another researcher that he's the 38th author of this uh, publication. And the second author shared that it's great, but then the first researcher uh, shared again that uh, it's the 30 or he's the 
38 author called, called Wang. So for me, if I'm looking for an author uh, called Wang in this publication, I'll be certainly uh, lost. And again, another tweet saying um, that even a publication from uh, 1930 uh, can be uh, like, yeah, can be <laughs> referenced if it was, if we had uh, persistent identifiers. So here, um, this, this researcher is really looking for who created or who, um, yeah, built this work or who uh, uh, participated in this work. Uh, so these are the uh, bits for contributions. Uh, we can have the uh, archive ID, we can have the DOI. So these are, these are the digital uh, persistent identifiers for object or for contributions. We have also the bits for physical uh, objects like for magazine or books. And this is really the schema from where uh, the handle service as a uh, also a persistent identifier started. So uh, to understand how an URL and handle service can really be uh, a good link for an electronic resources in terms of persistency uh, over time. Then uh, pits for system uh, and uh, let's say open research uh, ready infrastructures. Um, we have this, this tweet where a researcher is saying that uh, it would be great if all journals are adopting one unique uh, identifier like ORCID and allowing this uh, single uh, sign-on system. Uh, this is the auto-update um, feature from uh, ORCID cross reference data site, and you can read about this uh, later on. Um, this is how basically the assertion is done on the repository of KAUST, uh, as an example, in, in Saudi Arabia. You can see the use of um, the ISNI ID for uh, the, this organization, and you can use that. You can see that the source here is, uh, is KAUST. And again, uh, another assertion, and you can see that the handle uh, uh, identifier is uh, used here uh, also to assert uh, works. The PIDs drivers and PIDs initiatives, we can, um, yeah, we can cite uh, the FAIR principles, uh, we can cite um, yeah, events like Pidapalooza, and of course the work done by Libsense, and previously uh, the work done by Oda and um, or Odin and Thor. Uh, how to get involved? Basically, like to build statements or to encourage to uh, release statements and uh, recommendations and policies like the NRS South Africa in this case. Uh, also, with leading consortia and building consortia uh, around uh, ORCID and persistent identifiers uh, in order to ensure that uh, we have a community of practice uh, in place and in the region. This is an example from the NRF submission system. You can see that uh, here the profile is linked to an ORCID ID. Uh, this is also an example from the African Academy of Science. And you can see also that the ORCID ID is in the um, profile detail of uh, the uh, grant, uh, yeah, grant submitter, let's say. Uh, and uh, on demand from, from OMO, uh, I also added the Intambeko hub, which is recently launched by the South African ORCID um, consortium lead, and where you can really uh, use your um, institutional, uh, let's say, federated identity access uh, to um, basically connect with this hub which is also using the seamless access technology and uh, which is an ARI uh, 21 initiative uh, that is also um, kind of a trendy technology in federated uh, access and um, federated identity management. Uh, you can read more about this uh, on, yeah, later on for, for during the slides. Uh, I, I wanted also to share the Nakosti example and how they managed to uh, integrate ORCID uh, in the sign-in uh, page. So you can use your ORCID ID to connect to uh, the National Commission for Science and Technology and Innovation in Kenya, and uh, really uh, gain time in uh, not entering a lot of information regarding um, your background or your career. 
Um, and, yeah, so th th thanks to, to the speakers also today for sharing uh, regarding EOSC. I'll not uh, talk a lot about it, but this is really um, showing the um, uh, the identity hub that Giant, uh, which is the European uh, network uh, uh, or yeah, European regional uh, network uh, is trying to build or already built with uh, with with um, uh, with EOSC and the work is still going on. So uh, I'm sure that one day uh, all the federated identity in in Africa will be linked there. And uh, of course, if we'll have uh, a um, African Open Science Cloud. I'm sorry for the bird noise. This is the Hadida in South Africa. <laughs> uh, so in case we'll have like a African Open Science Cloud connected uh, like this one, uh, they can also use it to access um, uh, the hub or the platform. Uh, this is also showing the uh, switch dual affiliation API uh, in, in Switzerland. And uh, this is really showing that uh, ORCID is part of the um, schema uh, to get or to link affiliation to uh, the AGID. Uh, this is the example from uh, UKRI. And um, this is showing how uh, ORCID is beneficial uh, for review recognition. And uh, of course, you can also read about this article uh, yeah, um, later on. This is the ORCID presence, um, let's say, worldwide, where it's green, it's uh, uh, consortia, and where it's blue, it's members. We celebrated our first member in Cameroon two days ago. So, yay. Yeah. Then, sorry, uh, this is the vision of ORCID um, that you can see the slide. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's a world where all who participate in research, scholarship and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions, affiliations across time, disciplines and borders. This is really uh, what we're trying to achieve um, by all this as a nonprofit organization. Uh, of course, we, this is, these are the membership categories. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit those links and uh, discover those different uh, categories. And then uh, you are also invited to the next joint meeting between DataSite, Crossref, and ORCID. Uh, and this is the link here on this slide. So you can uh, hopefully you can um, register on time and uh, attend. And then, uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, this, this presentation, the, all this conference, and uh, thank you for uh, listening. And uh, happy to have to receive the question and answers you know, questions, basically. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Nabil, for this brilliant presentation. Uh, <laughs> um, is that is that, just, is, is that correct? Eshe, right? yeah. Eche, okay, Eche or Oshe. Eshe, Eshe. Okay, okay. Yeah, you are welcome. Um, we move to the next presentation, which is actually the last presentation for the day uh, before we, we go into the question and answer session. Uh, this presentation is going to be by Bill Hobart. Uh, he's the head of policy and engagement, DISC. Uh, he's going to to be talking to us on DISC case study, transition open research in the UK. Uh, Bill Hubbard works for GISC as head of policy and engagement with the digital resources directorate, leading on stakeholders engagement and policy response through the portfolio of open research services and support activities at GISC provides to the HE sector. Bill's work in open access has included being the director of the Center for Research Communication at the University of Nottingham, founding and developing the award-winning OA uh, services, Romeo, Juliet, and Open DOAR, which are used around the world to underpin repository use and open access development. Bill has also worked closely with OA publishers and advised on the transition involved for commercial publishers for tra tra traditional, to OA, uh, traditional to OA business models. 
Bill has a background in innovative development of ICT in higher education and research and the associated change management needed. Developing AI systems to support decision-making system for managing research funding and leading on the integration of ICT into university teaching and learning. He's going to be talking to us today on um, the case study of GISC transition to open research in the UK. Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting uh, Bill to make uh, his presentation. Okay, folks, uh, I hope everybody can see that properly. Let me just sort out my windows here. Jolly good. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Bill Hubbard. Um, I've got my contact details at the end. So if you do want to ask questions beyond that, which we can cover in this session, then do feel free to get in touch with me afterwards. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, this presentation is about the UK experience and uh, approach to the adoption of open research as seen through the eyes of JISC, J-I-S-C as we pronounce that uh, as JISC. Now, yes. others may have a different uh, perspective, but I think that this is a reasonable consensus as to how uh, we in the UK are approaching the transition. Uh, now, obviously, other countries may respond in different ways uh, because there are different pressures and different socio-economic conditions. So this presentation isn't a recommendation, uh, but I hope it will provide useful information that may assist discussions. And I've already seen a lot of parallels with some of the material that's been presented by other speakers. So uh, very quickly about JISC. Uh, JISC, we're a not-for-profit uh, membership organization. Um, so uh, our members are the research uh, institutions, the higher education institutions, the, the, the further education institutions in the UK. And we operate uh, a shared digital infrastructures and services. Uh, we negotiate sector-wide deals with IT providers, with software vendors, with uh, commercial publishers for journal subscriptions for, for libraries uh, and for publishing, detail, uh, publishing deals. Um, we provide trusted advice and practical assistance for our members. Uh, we've got about 1,000 staff in the organization. Uh, we provide Janet, which is the UK academic network. Um, we offer cybersecurity, data analytics, etc. And in digital resources, which is uh, uh, my own directorate, we negotiate and provide archive collections and library catalogues and bibliographic information for libraries and research. And for open research, we provide services for members and some for global use, uh, a preservation service for repositories, a research repository solution and guidance and things. So we're a very wide ranging digital services provider for the sector. Now, open research um, in the UK, really um, the moves towards open access started about 20 years ago. Um, obviously in some areas, um, it goes back further than that, but as a unified effort for, for sectoral change, it's about 20 years. Uh, we first started working on a national infrastructure for repositories in uh, 2003, so through a project called Sherpa. And uh, JISC has been in the forefront of many of the significant developments since then. Initially, we were able to fund uh, a number of open access initiatives, uh, but more recently, we have acted as service providers, as negotiating bodies, and through organizing events, etc. So while we have been a catalyst for open access, we were very fortunate in that we caught a wave of enthusiasm and many, many other people and organizations have been involved uh, and change has only come about because of the efforts of all of these different organizations, all of these different individuals and initiatives. Um, one significant point that we can offer from the UK experience is that change in a sector, sectoral change, needs the engagement of the whole sector. It can't just be uh, one individual um, organization acting on its own. It has to have sectoral support. So um, the basis for the UK uh, transition 
um, is that we're going for both green and gold open access solutions. So we're not just looking at um, repositories. We're not just looking at uh, open access um, journals. We're looking at both of them and seeing them as complementary uh, routes towards getting open access to, to research outputs. And we see open researchers encompassing the whole research process and changing the whole research process. So that's articles and books and data, that's open lab books, open peer review, analysis and reuse, looking at reproducibility. Um, now, uh, the, uh, the next part, uh, uh, so we've got, we're going for both green and gold open access, we're going for um, open research in its entirety, uh, and one of the key elements is significant and long-term advocacy. Um, so from a wide variety of actors uh, to researchers and authors, etc., this is significant effort. Um, and people have worked long and hard on this over the last 20 years, because in order to change a work, work culture, you need culture change. And cultural change is very long and hard work. So... Um, one of, the, one of the things I would just keep emphasizing is the amount of advocacy that we have to do and keep doing is substantial. Um, we've had increasingly pro open access policies from government and from research funders and from institutions. And we've created support services, ideally uh, just before they're needed by the mainstream. The trick is to, to try to see what will be needed and to try to plug that into development plans very early on so that by the time it is needed, you have the system in place, you have the software in place, you have the data in place. That can actually be quite difficult to forecast that need ahead of time. But it, 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 is, it is very important to have those support services in place. Um, now, seeing this as um, advocacy and uh, policies and support services in a way this echoes the LibSense strategy that was presented yesterday of capacity building and policy and, and, and infrastructure. Um, now one of the significant points is as, as I said that advocacy is absolutely vital and advocacy has helped create a receptive environment uh, but it's policy enactment it's actually policies that created the step changes. Both are actually essential because policy can't operate in a vacuum you need take up, you need people's agreement, you need enthusiasm from people. But advocacy and goodwill alone can't overturn established habits and processes. So you do need both. Now, there are two key policies which I'll mention, uh, which have really uh, been the uh, made the most change, most, most change in the UK. And these are the UKRI grant policy and the REF eligibility policy. <clears throat> I'll explain what those are. Both of them come direct from government agencies. Um, the UK Research Innovation is an organization that's abbreviated as UKRI, and that's a section of government um, that directs research and innovation funding. Um, it comes direct from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So that's one of the most significant government departments. And it gives out research grants through various research councils like the Medical Research Council or the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, different subject based research councils. But the UKRI policy, which has recently been reviewed and, and just came out about two weeks ago, mandates that peer reviewed research articles should be made open access at the time of publication with a CC BY license, which means that people are free to reuse it in whatever way they, they wish, as long as you've got attribution. Now, this can be done either through an open access journal um, or a journal which allows open access or through a repository. So again, it's this, the both green and gold routes to satisfying this, this policy. But the significant thing is it's a condition of getting the grant. And if you don't make your work open access, it may af affect future awards. Now, the next policy that made a significant difference is the REF eligibility policy, excuse me. <clears throat> now, this is put out by a group called Research England, which is actually part of UKRI, but they're the part of UKRI which deal with the university research and knowledge transfer in England. 
and they oversee the assessment of the quality of university research through the research excellence framework. This is a, <clears throat> an exercise which takes place every, about every six years or so. And it looks at research outputs from each institution under 34 subject headings and awards each subject heading a mark for that institution. So the institution's REF score affects the level of research funding that they're going to get. So ensuring that an institution's outputs are eligible for assessment is financially crucial for the institution. So for their REF policy, they made it um, compulsory that for any output to be considered, it had to be made open access at the time of publication. So this was significant because not only did it catch the most high profile outputs because institutions want their best quality and most high profile outputs to be considered in their score for this exercise, but it meant that anything that was likely to be put in for this ref exercise over a six year period, that had to be made open access at the time of acceptance. So that really stirred things up. Now, both of these policies come direct from government agencies. One affects individual funding for researchers and the other affects institutional funding. So the pro open access UKRI policies is directly attached to research grants and directly affects the researcher. The pro open access REF policy is attached to research assessment and therefore to institutional funding. So that directly affects the senior levels of a university. So two very influential policies. So the UK approach in concentrating on policies and policy compliance and services to help policy compliance may look like it's based around the compulsion of authors pushing for policy compliance. But the actual rationale for this and the practice is very different. It's complex and it's nuanced. Now, now what do I mean by this? Well, interestingly, almost all academics I've spoken to <clears throat> are broadly in favour of open access, more or less. The way that it works might upset things for them, but when you ask them if they're in favour of the idea of open access, more or less they say yes. So why didn't they all change to open access immediately? Well, the reason is there are these very well-established working habits which prevent it. For example, esteem indicators that might be associated with particular journal brands, institutional heads might tell their staff that they have to publish in particular journals or give them uh, reward, um, career rewards or financial rewards if they manage to get a, an article into a particular journal. So if that journal doesn't offer an open access option, what's the researcher to do? So um, there are an awful lot of ingrained working habits, which mean that even if an author is in favor of the idea of open access, it just might be too much bother, too much work to change the way they work. So how can these established habits be overcome? Um, well, some institutions in the UK have got open access activity as an assessed activity when they consider an individual for promotion, how much open access work have they done? Alternatively, as was pointed out this morning, there's a move to using alternative metrics. But another way, uh, um, which, which I think underlies the British approach, is to have open access positive policies and insist on compliance, but you make it very easy for authors to comply. So a policy like that gives authors cover to challenge existing relationships and, and esteem arrangements. If authors are in favor of open access practice, but have been held back through pressure or, 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 or simply by not seeing it as worth their time to learn new habits, then policy compliance can push at an already half open door. Now, I'm not saying that all UK authors have simply been waiting for the chance to publish open access, but there is already sufficient support that pushing policy compliance isn't simply pushing a change that nobody wants or is prepared for. So uh, achieving change through policy compliance isn't necessarily forcing people to do something they don't want to do. And really effective policies um, encourage 
kind of wholesale change in the environment, and they can bring clarity and efficiency to tangled processes. And if any additional load is supported by efficient services, then compliance can give cover to people that want to work differently. So we mustn't see policies as just a stick to hit people with. These can be very supportive things. So building the future through policy frameworks like these two policies needs work in three key areas. Now I'll, I'll cover those next. Alignment and communication, negotiation and publishing, and providing supportive services. So for alignment and uh, communication, there needs to be lots of communication for a workable transition. <clears throat> the change affects so much and it affects so many people. It affects research stability, uh, productivity, and it affects people's money. So there has to be a lot of communication, a lot of outreach, a lot of debate, a lot of opportunities for discussion. Um, all absolutely essential. Before the release of the UKRI policy, there was significant, substantial public consultation for well over a year. There were lots of opportunities for all the interested parties to contribute and to comment on draft versions and propose updates. There were lots of meetings, lots of time to work through implications of fine details like um, where commas were placed and where brackets were in the policy. There was you know, opportunity to do that sort of thing. So that's one example of where you need to communicate about these policies. Now, research is a global endeavor. So it's essential to make sure we're aligned with international best practice. And we've been active in various European projects like Driver and Open Air uh, and EOSC, which was mentioned this morning. And with the groups in Australia and Latin America and, and CORE, C-O-A-R, as the International Repository Group, et cetera. The UKRI policy is aligned with the Coalition S, Plan S principles. And um, in fact, JISC is actually quite active in the Coalition S organization. Now, JISC is a membership organization, so communication also goes down to our members and up from our members. We represent our members' interests. We take great pains to find out what they think, what they are concerned about, what they see as, as important. And we actively engage with funders and activists and advocacy groups and academics. And we, we put on events and supportive fora for discussion. And we try to bring together different views. Uh, we don't try to exclude people that don't agree with us. We try to bring them in and see where we can find consensus and common ground. So uh, effective policies also need to be embedded within a coherent environment. So one of the major uh, aims of, of uh, alignment and communication is to actually try to align policies so that they use the same terminology, they use the same timescales, they, the, they, they respect what other parties' policies are saying so that academics aren't put in an awkward position where they have two conflicting policies which they both have to comply with. Now in terms of negotiations and, and, and publishing, JIST negotiates these multi-year, multi-million pound subscription arrangements with publishers on behalf of the sector. Now the size of these deals gives us significant bargaining power to ask publishers to change conditions and allow development of, of open access arrangements in their journals. We've already improved open access for authors, uh, linked subscription arrangements, um, so that authors can publish open access in certain journals and have the cost for that included in the subscription price paid for by the institution. But we're now negotiating transitional arrangements with uh, publishers as a, as a bridge to future open access models for journals. Um, these are linked to the ideas in Plan S, whereby funder policies will allow publication in traditional journals just for a limited time, and only as long as publishers agree to transition to an open access business model. So the purpose of these negotiations is to achieve a cost-effective and permanent and sustainable transition to open access by traditional publishers, uh, obviously whose, whose journals still occupy significant positions of power uh, and, and influence. Okay, now I mentioned the other um, aspect, the other pillar of, 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 of this is supportive services, infrastructure services. Now, what we have here is uh, the journal, uh, let me get the little pointer, the journal um, or research publication lifecycle, going from selecting a journal, checking compliance, managing costs, 
reporting on compliance, etc. Submission, acceptance, publication and use. So for each stage, we've tried to provide supportive services so that where an author is required to engage with open access, these services are designed to help relieve that burden. So Romeo gives the author a breakdown of what a journal will allow them to do. Juliet gives a breakdown of what a funder requires the author to do. And um, Sherpa Fact brings this, those two together for uh, some policies and says, OK, if you want to publish in this journal, will your funder let you do it? So there are various services throughout the, the entire process. I'm more than happy to go into detail about those with, with, with folks um, uh, after the uh, presentation. Um, I'd just note that although this particular breakdown is UK based, we do provide four services on a global level, which cover four. Recording stopped. Um, just... No, uh, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. I just got a flag in, in my ear yeah. from, I think, from Zoom or something saying recording uh, stopped. So. Yeah, I think it was a, a switch of hosts, that's all. Can okay, someone I'll... confirm that you can hear Bill? Yep, I'll, I'll carry on if that's okay. Yeah, I think you're good oh. to continue. Okay. okay, so these four global services um, are, are, are Romeo, what uh, or Juliet rather, what does your funder want you to do? Romeo, does your chosen journal allow you to do it? Um, open door, where can you archive your work and open access and, and core, uh, where, which allows other people to find it? Okay. I, I think you can start rounding up. Sorry, Doug? You can, start, you can start rounding up your presentation? Yep, sure thing, yep. Just a, a couple more. We've got our current developments um, in the UK. We're looking at its UKRI policy as the main driver for change. Uh, we're looking at institutional licenses, which require institution, or which um, uh, institutions will adopt to allow them to retain copyright to make any output from that institution open access. We're looking at open access books. Um, the situation there isn't quite the same as with journals. Um, we're looking uh, and helping to support university presses, um, something called Octopus, which is decoupling the, the, the publication process um, to allow kind of micro publication of different stages of, of, a, of an article, looking at the hypothesis or the, the method, et cetera, separately. And, uh, BIS, which I mentioned earlier, that the, the uh, uh, government agency is about to conduct a major review of research bureaucracy with, it, with a, a view to achieving greater efficiencies. In terms of directions, I think now in the UK we've got more openness, there's more acceptance of openness. We're looking at reducing bureaucracy. The expectations of publishers on publishers have changed considerably. There's a younger generation of researchers that see sharing as, as baseline behavior. They use social media. They share material far more widely than, than uh, uh, the previous generation. We're moving towards form formalizing financial support of open infrastructure. There are a lot of open in infrastructure services around the world that are operating on soft money. So we're wanting to look and see how international efforts can be made to, to firm up the, their, their, their sustainability. And we're uh, looking at... Um, uh, ethics in research. And finally, the types of publications are starting to change because so far, in most cases, digital publication is simply a digital analog of a traditional paper journal. That's very frustrating, but there are increasing signs that that type of publication is starting to change. Um, so use of multimedia, publications that develop over time, ongoing peer review, accompanying data sets, etc. All of these are made possible by open research and should make research work more efficiently and more effectively and more easily. And, and obviously that has to be our goal. Okay, so more than happy to take questions during the question and answer or to answer your questions individually afterwards if you want to contact me at my email address as shown. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bill, for the presentation. Uh, without waste of time, I will want us to move to the next item, which is actually the discussion and Q&A. Uh, but before then, I will give a brief summary of what transpired today.
We, our first presentation was by Professor Sahalu from Ahmad Bele University, who presented on open science at institutional level, challenges and prospects. He actually highlighted some of the uh, challenges, especially as it affects Nigeria. And he prospered some solutions on how to overcome some of those challenges. Then we had a presentation from Dr. Pam, who presented on upskilling and reskilling librarians and researchers, uh, research, researchers for open science. Uh, sorry, researchers for open science. Then Irena Kushma presented on open science community and capacity building. Uh, Nabil Kisibi presented on persistent identifier for connecting research outputs, researchers and research funders. Then the last presentation we had today is by Bill, who actually gave us the UK experience. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned, which actually captured my attention is the fact that UK as usual works on policies Though he emphasized the significance of, of advocacy, but he did mention that providing appropriate policy is what actually uh, gave the, the UK the basis to move to forge ahead. And I think as a country, Nigeria, we have a lot to learn from that. Uh, probably we can leverage on the state fund to provide that basis to lead in that respect. And I'm happy that uh, the uh, uh, Standing Committee on Research and Development of TED Fund, a committee to work out the National Research and Development Foundation uh, is actually working in that direction. And uh, it was, uh, a good thing that the ES Ted Fund was with us yesterday uh, and gave his insights on some of the things that are being discussed. Uh, we have a couple of questions that um, are here with me. Uh, some are coming uh, from the flow. The first question we have, which can be answered by actually a couple of us. Um, the first one is what training is available to help open science development on campuses? Probably we can invite uh, Professor Salu to make, uh, to initiate that. Can, anyone, can, can anyone else from the, the panel is yes. free to, to, to contribute to that as well? Yeah. Maybe before Professor Salu, you see? I, I was going to, do you mind? This is Omar Oaya Wakren. So I, I was going to comment, and Bill is just sort of okay. you know, uh, raised it again in the chat, you know. And so we have 30, 30 repositories, Nigerian repositories in Open Door. When I looked at uh, Professor Halu's example, it does seem that some of these repositories um, need some work, not only with the content that is in them, but with the infrastructure that they, that, that, uh, they run on. So I am seeing some old versions. I am seeing, and so that tells me uh, what state they might be in infrastructurally. Uh, interestingly, in the Lipsense Infrastructure Working Group meeting last, last meeting, we had been discussing a program to um, uh, identify this sort of infrastructure and see how we can bring them uh, to upgrade them so we can actually leverage some of the systems we are developing. So maybe that's something we can also look at with Nigeria, um, Owen, yep. and see if we can get, get an inventory of what's really going on with these repositories. Yeah. Yes, any other contributor on that? Okay, probably we can move to the next question which is how can we instill open science culture and practice in our lecturers and students? Uh, I think this is also related to the first question. 
because it, the first question is talking about training and this specific specifying uh, 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 culture and practice in our like open open science culture and practice in our lecturers. So, uh, anybody wants to contribute to this? I can start, and uh, after my talk, we yeah. will change there are some okay. uh, messages okay. with uh, Owen that uh, we'd like to schedule uh, another meeting uh, in late October for colleagues from uh, Nigerian universities to brainstorm um, how we could uh, help each other to either strengthen existing training programs or launch new ones. And um, I would also like to invite everyone uh, who works with uh, capacity building, skills and training, and uh, who would like to be part of uh, Lipsen's capacity building working group, uh, please uh, let me know and uh, we'll, uh, we'll add you to our mailing list and uh, it would be great to talk with you about uh, strengthening capacity buildings uh, in your countries, but also in Africa in general. So it's a call for participation and uh, announcement of uh, specific webinars. Hello? Right, uh, Professor, uh, Professor, Sah uh, Professor Sahalu, you probably need to mute your mic. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bill, you want to say something? Uh, just to, to answer one of the questions that, that's that's uh, come up, what are the uh, what are some of the advocacy strategies at different levels used for the success achieved so far? <clears throat> and as, as I said, there's been significant work put into advocacy over the past sort of 20 years, really. Um, and a lot of it is just quite low level, local advocacy within institutions uh, where the uh, repository staff, it, it was uh, typically started by, by the repository staff and they were typically within libraries, just go out and talk about open access. So talk directly and, and individually to researchers. Um, because sometimes at larger scale events, individuals' concerns don't actually come out. People are nervous about appearing uninformed uh, in front of their peers. And so um, they can come to an open access advocacy event, which looks at how the, 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 the process works, looks at different support services that are available, but their questions, their concerns, their fears still don't come out. So. Advocacy needs to take place at a lot of different levels. It needs to take place at an individual level. Talking to individual academics needs to take place by going into coffee rooms in, in departments, by attending kind of departmental events and talking about open access there. It needs to take place at an institutional level where you talk about institutional policies for, on open access, where you, talk, you, you ask questions about what is the institute going to do in response to a national policy it needs to take place at the level of um, the, the pro vice chancellors at sort of the senior levels of a university dealing with research. You need to get onto committees and to present papers to them to talk about implications of open access or open research. So there needs to be a continual conversation at all of these different levels within an institution. Then there also needs to be advocacy at a national level. So when funders come out with a policy, either they do the, the advocacy themselves, like UKRI did in this massive public consultation exercise that they took that they carried out before they produced their policy. Or if the funders themselves don't want to do it, then institutions have to pick up that that task themselves and actually start national conversations about what the open access policy, the, the research open access policy means. Um, within uh, the UK, we set up something called UCOR, the UK Council of Research Repositories, and that's a professional group for repository administrators to get together to talk about advocacy, to talk about difficulties that they have in open access with their institution, so that they, you can, they can form self-help groups to try to 
say what works in advocacy for them. So there's a lot of different approaches that you need to make, and you need to make them at a lot of different levels, right from the individual through to the national. And one of the things is you have to keep doing it because it's always been a surprise to me that you can go and say the same message to a department year after year, and it's still somehow fresh to some people in that department. So you need to keep at it. Okay, um, uh, th thank you. We, we have a question here for, for uh, Nabil. And the question goes this way. How can a PID strategy help with research funding and impact assessment? Sure. So, um, of course, the first thing that we need in uh, in grant submission is to identify uh, um, the user or identify um, the person that is uh, um, submitting the the the, uh, the research. But then it goes. Um, this identification goes flowing into the system. Uh, and uh, link basically um, this this grant or this, this submission from the start to the ORCID record of uh, the uh, individual. And this is really what's creating this um, dynamic or this interoperability between systems uh, that is um, allowing a local, let's say, um, custom submission system uh, to be really connected with a global registry and not only um, for persistent identifiers for individuals like ORCID or uh, Research ID, but also with other um, registries uh, for, uh, for, yeah, for organizational identification or for uh, object uh, identification. So recently Crossref adopted um, what we call uh, the grant uh, ID or uh, uh, a yeah a link to uh, fund ref in in, uh, in a way so uh, you can uh, also link your um, grant uh, details and grant data or grant metadata um, with your uh, publication in in, in crossref and then uh, this is also flowing to uh, to orchid um, but yeah so this is basically um, how, how it works um, between systems and how uh, this is creating this uh, interoperability. How uh, this is answering your uh, question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just thought of another question that I feel Nabil should also quickly answer. Uh, of recent, it has been a very big challenge in Nigeria that most of uh, the universities, for example, uh, are not featuring well in the global ranking of universities. And I, since there are many participants uh, from Nigeria, uh, I will want you to comment on the relationship between ORCID and the uh, ranking of universities. Nabil? When you say ranking of universities, Prof, prof what are you referring to? Web ranking? Or? Yeah, the, the global web ranking. Yeah, um, I think that's slightly um, um, different um, in terms of uh, the underlying technologies that are used for, 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 for the ranking. Those are more okay. web, web protocol related. Um, I think what... Um, the paid strategy is, is more to, applies more to um, specific um, processes and um, systems that uh, use uh, certain uh, persistent identifiers as kind of indexes that can be used for cross-reference cross with other systems that are interoperable. So I think that question slightly slightly separate from what um, okay. Nabil was talking about. Okay. But uh, in saying that, there are a couple of hands that I can see raised, and I think we'll want to attend to those questions and then maybe close out this panel session by kind of looking at what are some of the things that we should be doing as a community in Nigeria to move uh, open access forward. Um, Bill has said a lot of things. Uh, about what was done in the UK. I hope we can, we can uh, affect that challenge in less than 20 years 
um, to, to, to move forward in a more positive way. But he, he, he mentioned some of the bottom up and top down approaches um, that are being used, you know, with, typically with the UKRI um, uh, policies. And I think um, we should also want to speak to that in terms of what uh, TED Fund, as one of our major funders in Nigeria, could maybe incorporate some of those ideas into their policies uh, that inform their own grant uh, awarding uh, criteria. But I, I think that might be for a wider discussion, but I, I see two hands up and maybe we should just deal with those questions first of all, and then maybe come back to look at the, the wider, wider perspectives that we want to look at going forward. So I see a hand, uh, I think it's Mohammed uh, Ahmed. If you're still there, do you want to ask your question? Mohammed Ahmed. Um, Allah, can you give him the Muhammad floor? Ali. Yes. Mohammed, do you wish to speak? Right, we don't seem to be able to hear from you. Mohammed? Right, we don't seem to be able to hear from Mohammed. There's Thank also you, um, so maybe Obaro Jr. Do you wish to ask your question? Is he uh, muted, Allah? Uh, yes, he has permission to speak now. Obaro, do you wish to speak? Doesn't appear to, but I think. Um, okay. We have another person, Toluwani. Okay. Toluwani, can you put your question across? You also ask this question in the chat. Um, um, good morning, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panelists, and for everyone who have uh, given their time for this morning. I actually want to know, looking can at this policy... Can you introduce, your, can you introduce yourself, uh, sir? Okay. My name is uh, Toluani Taiwo David. Uh, I'm actually from uh, London Digital University, or PAC, and I'm from Nigeria. Um, Hello, sir. I want to ask, Looking at the policies that uh, we've discussed to hit uh, open uh, research uh, in the institution of, of learning, how can these approaches and policies be applied to visual communication discipline? Talking about because that is where I belong. I applied in. I belong to the applied art, that is graphic design, in particular. But most of the open research uh, policies actually dealt with the sciences, libraries, and, and so on. How can we adopt this for these other disciplines that are, uh, let's say, like 80% practical? That's my question. Okay, thank you. Uh, this, okay, Dr. Pam, you want to respond to that? How can we adopt the policies to uh, humanities instead of uh, sciences only and library? Mm. Difficult question, actually. Uh, I think uh, the, the person posing the question has mentioned that this is part of um, arts and humanities and it's about um, producing, I guess, different types of art through different mediums. Go ahead, please. Bam is muted. Uh, you, are, you are muted? You want to unmute? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I was saying it's a difficult question. So the, um, the person posing the question mentioned that this probably these are artifacts of some sort that are created for the purpose of um i don't know um maybe 
presenting research or outputs of research in, in a way that's visual or from different types of media. So I suppose um, policy around that has got to be about how do you protect the, um, the sources of this, uh, these outputs? Uh, how do you um, ensure that um, those who are producing the outputs are properly attributed? And um, how do you store it? How is it discovered? This sort of thing. So, so um, I suppose it really depends on existing around these, these different issues in that, those institutions and how you can translate that into um, policies that make those outputs um, uh, accessible freely or accessible openly. I really am not an expert in this, so <laughs> therefore I, I really cannot um, provide a, a more specific uh, way in which you can do that. So that, that really depends upon those who are producing those types of artifacts and what they know is important to what, what information they know is important to share and what information they, they would like to protect around those, those outputs. But okay. beyond that, I'm, I'm really not sure what would be more specific okay. guidelines about the policy. Okay, thank you. Bill? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I just uh, um, agree with, with Pam. It really de does depend on the outputs that are... It really does depend on on the particular outputs, <clears throat> but what I, uh, I'd say is that um, because I used to work in a, in a creative arts environment myself, I, I used to um, uh, was a senior lecturer in a design department, and where we have research outputs which were assessed as research outputs, then I think that it, it's fair enough to ask those for those research outputs to be made openly accessible. If those outputs have been paid for out of public funding, out of uh, university funding, then um, I think it's fair enough to ask for those outputs to be made accessible. Like, for example, if your research output is a dance performance, then maybe a video of that dance performance should be made openly accessible. I think one of the difficulties can come where, when, where you have had traditionally an arts-based performing arts or a creative arts-based output, which has not only been a research output, but also the individual has made money out of it and where they've sold that. And so that is a challenge. Uh, and there it comes down to um, a balance of, okay, if it's been funded out of public money, then is it fair for an individual to then profit by it? Or if it's something that the individual has to create and profit by it, is it then fair to assess that as a research output? So like uh, uh, the introduction of uh, IT in a lot of different areas, it, 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 when you try to introduce IT or kind of openness, sometimes the difficulties and the questions that are exposed aren't a problem with openness, they're actually a problem with the way that we've done things in the past. So that's all I'd add to that. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, any other contributor? None? Um, I think there's a few more questions. Um, I can see a few more hands raised. Uh, okay. I think, I know we, we have kind of overrunning. I think we can just give about 15 minutes um, before we, we, we round up. Um, okay. So I'll indulge the panelists if they can hang around for about 15 more minutes um, before we, we wrap up. Um, there are a number of hands raised. So uh, I think uh, there's Fumilaya. Do you want to Fumilaya. ask very quickly? And any member of the panelists, uh, any panel member who feels that they can answer the question can just uh, interject. Thank you very much, Sir Zama. Uh, I don't know if the issue of. Um, Introduce yourself, the, please. Uh, sorry, I'm Fumilaya from, from um, Ocean State University. Okay. So I don't know if the issue of the open access uh, publishing, the um, publishing in um, high impact journals, which uh, 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 the publication the charges can be very, very high, as in thousands of dollars. I'm wondering how individuals in uh, developing countries like ours can bear such. 
So if, um, I don't know if it has been addressed, if I wasn't attentive. So I want it to be addressed. How do we solve uh, such a problem? Thank you, sir. Any um, response? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can start because my colleagues uh, also work with negotiating uh, licensing with publishers and uh, article processing charges. Uh, and uh, one way is to try to include uh, waivers and discounts in uh, the agreements, in subscription agreements uh, that uh, library consortia or organization sign when it's not only access to materials, but it's also ability to publish in open access without additional costs. And um, we've been successful in some countries, but uh, I guess in a country like Nigeria, it would be hard. Another international effort, and um, CHISC is part of it, is uh, to try to influence publishers uh, with whom CHISC, Eiffel, and other players sign agreement that they would uh, include waivers and discounts to other nations, uh, to the Global South countries. Um, that's that's a short term strategy, a long term strategy, I would say, to move away from article processing charges and uh, try to find uh, an equitable uh, publishing system that wouldn't require researchers without funding uh, begging for waivers and APCs and uh, enable uh, equal publishing opportunities for everyone, but I'm afraid we, we're we still far far ahead from, from the system unless we, we just say that uh, we stop collaborating with publishers who charge so much and we, we find better publishers um, providing same quality of services for less money because I think it's also outrageous how much some publishers are making. And unfortunately, there are small few who are making those money. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, any other response? Um, do you may want to please, comment? Please put. Mustafa? Yes. Can I go ahead, please? Please, please do. You're Thank welcome. You yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, I think I've hung on uh, for some time, so um, I'm privileged to be here back today. Actually, I have to have done my apologies. Uh, I'm supposed to have joined since morning because I was airborne. So and on my arrival, I said, let me quickly be part of this. I can see that a lot of things have been spoken about. And um, thanks to Bill for some of the perspective he shared about the experience in the UK and uh, all other people that have actually made good presentations. Uh, permit me to say that um, it is critical at this point because uh, the model that is being used in on in terms of funding is uh, public uh, compliance in terms of we are actually leveraging on public funding for the research. And uh, as that one goes on, uh, essentially is tending towards making some of the outcomes, if not all of the outcomes, uh, to be public, um, making sure that at the end of the day, we are leveraging on the platforms or opportunities of open science. So ideally, that is how it's supposed to be. However, I think I've heard of some issues that were raised now uh, about the uh, capacity building in that area. Uh, Tepo actually does some capacity building on grant research writing and uh, proposal stuff like that. I want to believe that part of the takeaway or take home from this particular engagement is for us to come up with a model that we think can work for our academia in the country. And we can see how we can actually integrate that into some of the capacity building programs uh, of Tetron. That's number one. Number two, the issue of policy is critical, but you agree with me again that it's not about uh, policy in Nigeria, it's about implementation. So uh, I think we need to evolve a new strategy that we evolve uh, basically maybe uh, leveraging on the triple elite model. We see that we have an hybrid situation whereby we don't have a policy on national open science uh, or open research and at the end of the day is not being implemented. 
we can work a way around that and make sure that this is being implemented uh, across board. And uh, I want to believe if we are able to do this, then it's going to help the country a lot and it actually uh, attain what we are looking at in terms of global competitiveness. The third one has to do with the APC, the academic publishing centers that are being developed by Techcom. And you can see that we have them, uh, a number of them across the country. So uh, this principle of open science can be part of the integral thing that they might be looking at going forward. And uh, again, it will involve us actually building some capacity in that respect. And uh, finally, we, can, we have an intervention line that has to do with library development. In that intervention line, we can actually look at open science and mixing that and see how we can incorporate some of the takeaways that we have here. But I mean, I believe in more of action rather than much of talk. So for us, we need to look at what we can take away from here and start uh, at different levels of implementation. While we are waiting for policy, there yeah, are intervention lines that can be leveraged uh, in third one, and uh, we can actually do that almost immediately, maybe effectively, uh, from now, I mean, next project per year. This would be a good one if all of us can agree to this, and I want to believe that these are the four things I can quickly see that are quick wins that we can uh, work with. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm yeah, sorry uh, for coming late. It's all right, uh, Professor Mustafa. I think it's also very important. And while action and uh, implementation is very important, it is also a key that we are all engage in the deliberations on the policy. Yes, I know we want to, to be action, but we can, we can set up a, a, a platform where there's actual engagement with the key practitioners and experts so that those policies can quickly come out and um, be executed on. So uh, I know there's so much that needs to be done and needs to be done quickly, but let's really ensure that we're doing it with good, good sound policies in place. You know, um, that would just be my, my comments on what you- I actually, have no, I actually have no objection to policy. That's why I actually put it first. But what I'm saying is that we should do it in such a way that we factor in some realities and uh, make it actionable. You know, in our own peculiar case, I mean, you can compare us uh, to the UK, you know the peculiarities. So making sure that we have the policy and it's implementable, it's actionable. That is what I'm just uh, making a uh, link with this. However, while that is ongoing, we can actually have some quick points around this so that uh, it won't be like uh, it's going to be two days of uh, serious engagement and the people cannot pick what they can do at their different level. For example, uh, part of what has been engaged upon is something that people can take back to their institution and teach to others. Even advocacy about open science alone is something. So how many faculty members are here, but if you have participated for the past two days and you take it to your own faculty, to your department, to your university, to your police, it's something. Let them just be aware of course, so that when the policy is there, people will now realize that, okay, there has been an effort. I've actually heard about this, and this how it works. So again, for me, I want a situation whereby we are able to do one or two things at our different levels, at our cycle of influence, so that immediately we can start speaking uh, the same language. Remember, all of us to agree, uh, we need a lot of reorientation, and uh, we need to move forward together at the same time. We need everybody to support. So I support that we should go by the way of policy, but we can still leverage whatever we have now to. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Mustafa. Now, um, really, we're really running over time here, and I can see five hands raised, and we it's already quarter to, to one. We really need to shut down this by one o'clock. So my suggestion is that all those with their hands raised, maybe we'll allow you to ask your question all of you ask your questions and then we'll try and see how we can deal with all of them in one go and then uh, wrap up. I think that's the only way we can, otherwise we'll be here for the rest of the afternoon and I'm sure all of us are very busy with things to do. So I think that's what we'll just do, we'll allow each and every person to put forward their question and then we'll just try to answer them as quickly as possible. So we we'll start with Solomon, we can ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, Prof. I'm Dr. Mate Solomon from Kisla University, Abiyakuta. 
Uh, my question is uh, the method that we can adopt to encourage open research in Nigeria University, including private institutions that will be all encompassing. By all encompassing, I mean that will cut across all disciplines. That is my question, Prof. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Next question, uh, Next Tim, question. Tim Ayanda. Yes. Okay, Tim Ayanda. Is Ayanda there? If Tim can't speak, can we move to the next person? Next Dr. Saidu Badamasi. Dr. Saidu. Hello. Good afternoon to everyone there. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the time to, to give my own contribution, even though I'm just uh, joined the program late because of other engagements. I'm Dr. Sayyidi Wadamasi from Federal University of Britain, Cape, right? Uh, I just want to call the attention of uh, the government. Science and technology may hardly uh, be achieved or developed in Nigeria as far as, far as uh, educational sector is not given uh, the priority. Every individual is capable of giving his own contribution in one way or the other, as far as science is concerned, but that person can only do it when they have the, 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 the necessary education or when they are equipped with the knowledge and the education that they should. Every citizen is a potential to contribute to the scientific knowledge and development, science and technology, but the educational institutions have not been given the attention by the government. So this is the reason why we may find it very difficult, especially in Nigeria, to see that science and technology has reached a certain level of appreciation due to this negligence in education or providing education to people. That is my own contribution. I think government should give priority on education so that people to develop their potential potentialities and contribute to the scientific science and technological knowledge. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Saidu. Uh, uh, I only feel that the government is not properly represented here to take your, your suggestions. Uh, maybe the organizers will pass your comments to them. Also. The next person? Christopher. Christopher is right, okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Please. Yes, please yes ask good afternoon. Please. Okay, but briefly, my question uh, has to do with the funding of publications. Christopher, where are you from? Introduce yourself. Where I'm you from, from the University of Agriculture in Abelkusa, Federal University of Agriculture in Abelkusa, Nigeria. Okay. Okay, thank you. It has to do with payment for publications in high impact journals. Um, usually, they will tell you if you must publish and be recognized, go to very high impact journal, uh, impact factor journals. If you must do that, you pay so much money. But I know that some institutions do fund their staff to be able to so publish. Is there any way government can come to our aid through one of our agencies to say, if you have research that stands out, we'll, we'll fund you with respect to publication, but then the issue of proprietary rights and others coming. So what do we do? Thank you, sir. Uh, I think and then the final question, um, I think from Conrad, Professor Conrad. Hello, Conrad. Yes. Yeah, can you ask your question, please? Uh, it's not a question. I just want to uh, appreciate. Can you make your comment very brief, please? I appreciate so, uh, all of you, Amal, Owen, uh, Irina, Pam, and the host of you. Uh, I've been with you guys since yesterday. I think a lot has been said. Uh, well, it is what we do after now that really matters. So um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kwokwala Mustafa really has um, tried to point out a few things. And I've also discussed with him a few things on that way. Um, I am from Covenant University and we run an open access uh, system. We have open access policy, probably the only one in, in the country. And we have funding to back it. So there's a lot that needs to be done, but I think um, considered effort at the national level will help out. So well, well done for a good outing. Uh, just like to stop there. 
Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, okay. thank you. Right. Um, so there were two questions that were really asked: um, the method to adapt open research and the issue of payment for journals in high impact uh, uh, platforms. I think Irina had already uh, touched on the second question, but um, if any of the panel members wants to quickly um, address those questions, so we can actually um, close. J just, just okay. to note. Um, oh, go ahead. Just to note on the um, question of payment for high impact factor journals. Yes, it, it, it is a, a, a real issue. If there aren't sufficient waivers or uh, sufficient uh, support to, to um, pay for that, if you haven't got the money, then that's a, that's a problem. But I would suggest that the way around it isn't necessarily to try to get more money to pay the journal isn't to get more money to perpetuate the system. I would suggest that the solution is to actually try to um, find different journals and uh, have different metrics so that the high, the impact factor of the journal isn't the, isn't the thing which drives your choice. Now that's only, that's going to take time to sort out. Um, but, uh, and, but sometimes we are the prisoners as academics. We are the prisoners of our own of our own beliefs, because even in the UK, um, when they were assessing research, uh, Research England were at great pains to say to all of the academics, it doesn't matter which journal you publish in, as long as it's a peer reviewed journal, we are not going to take any notice in our assessment of its impact factor. Um, now, even though they kept saying that, academics and authors um, kind of trapped themselves in, in their own belief and, and, and didn't believe it and will still go for high impact factor journals when they can. So I think that part of the issue and part of the answer is to try to stop us believing that these high impact factor journals are the most important ones. It's the research that's important. It's not the name of the journal. But that's culture change. That takes time. Thank you, Bill. Um, does anyone want to touch on the method to adopt open research? I guess that's already been sort of discussed in, in the presentations that we've had from um, Pam and uh, to, to some degree by Irina as well. Um, so Maybe I can add a bit. Uh, and it's, it's also about what uh, Conrad said. Uh, Covenant University uh, already has a successful experience with adopting an open access policy. And uh, in Lipsense, we wanted to document this kind of experiences. So it would be wonderful if we could work with Conrad and colleagues to write uh, a case study, how this policy was adopted uh, and uh, how it contributed to so many articles are available um, in a repository. And if we could uh, work together to see whether this kind of approach would work for public universities as well, or if a different approach would be needed, if we could work together to draft uh, a policy template uh, that would work for public and private universities in Nigeria and maybe start on the institutional level and also talk with that fund uh, how their policy could be adjusted to include open science practices. Uh. Yeah. Thank you. Can I make mm -hmm. a comment? Uh, regarding the cost of um, journal. If I can quickly go ahead on that. Um, Very briefly. I, I, yeah, my comment uh, one, I have two perspectives to that. And I think it's going to be part of our takeaway in that um, in the NRF that we actually administer now, we can look at a situation whereby provisions are going to be made for uh, impact, high impact uh, journal publication going forward. How do I mean? There are situations whereby I personally, one of my own case studies that when we have this COVID issue, we actually have a publication that actually went to nature and uh, by the time they give us the bill, it was a big challenge. So uh, as an individual, as a researcher, if you try to engage some of these organizations, yes, you could get uh, some um, uh, discount, but more importantly is for us to have a platform. Uh, there are things that the National Research and Development Foundation want to factor in 
into negotiating some of these deals with the big names that we are talking about. And if we can actually have our, our collective support and the, the NRD is established in the country, is part of the critical areas that we want to actually see how we can engage at corporate level so that uh, it's going to be uh, a benefit for all the academia. But in the short run, for NRF uh, funding, people can actually look at a line item that has to do with publication, whatever you have in mind, or where you think you want to publish in the future. I'm actually factoring that cost within the cap of the 50 million naira that we give uh, to the team of researchers. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. And um, uh, we'll have to wrap up um, at the, this point. Um, and I appreciate that response, uh, the Prof Mustafa. Um, and also we need to consider, uh, those are obviously short term things that we can do immediately. But um, as I think somebody commented, it will never be enough. So we, we still need to look at uh, the longer term strategies to, to, uh, to, to deal with this. And I do like uh, uh, some of the ideas that uh, Bill had, had mentioned. And again, we, we, we as a, an NREN, uh, in the business of trying to provide uh, infrastructure for publishing that will help towards, towards that. Of course, all the other uh, issues that need to be addressed with regards to um, the, the costs for processing, et cetera, do need to be addressed. But um, again, I think uh, as parts of the, the moving forward from, from here, one of the things that we will try to do, or we will be doing, is uh, creating a report um, and uh, basically sharing that report with uh, all the attendees and obviously putting that forward to some of the other representatives in TED Fund and other national bodies um, so we could actually move on from, from there with some of the recommendations and discussions that we've had in this meeting. Uh, I think that's really as much as I'd want to, to say for now and just uh, in closing remarks, just want to thank uh, TED Fund for mobilizing uh, your human resources to attend this symposium and uh, help with some of the organization. Um, and I'm happy that uh, we had the ear of the executive secretary yesterday. So a lot of things were, were, were said that he heard from the r and community. Um, I'd also like to thank all our panelists, uh, Bill Hubbard, Irina Kuchma, Mustafa Popwala, Pam Abbott, Nabil Kisibi, Omar Owaya, uh, I hope I haven't missed anyone, Professor Sahalu, who is no longer with us. Thank you for your time and efforts in the presentations. And obviously, we'll continue to work and uh, coordinate, collaborate with all of you for the call to action in Nigeria. So I, I, I do expect that we're going to have further engagements. Many of you are from the Lipsem's umbrella anyway, so that's a given. But uh, in the case of Bill Hubbard, I think we'll also want to reach out and work with JISC as well. Um, and uh, my thanks as well to Professor Yusuf Saidu, um, BVC of Usmanu Danfodio University for uh, moderating uh, today's um, session. And uh, last but not least, thank you for all the attendees who have taken time out to participate in this symposium. Um, by the, uh, over the weekend, we're going to make sure all the uh, presentations are made available to you. We're also going to ensure that the reports on our findings are shared with all of you and uh, we'll continue to engage in uh, further discussions. Um, and beyond that, we might even be looking at trying to reach out to all the attendees to potentially look at some working groups that can be created to address some of the various issues that have been raised in terms of being able to move um, open science and open research forward in Nigeria. But it's been very exciting. Uh, I think it's been a very productive two days. And I'd just like to thank everyone for your time and really look forward to further engagement in the very near future. So uh, on that note, I wish to say uh, have a good day, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much.